In old Western movies, you can always tell who the good guys and the bad guys are by the color of their cowboy hats. <laughs> the good guys wear white hats, and the bad guys, of course, wear black ones. Now, nobody in St. Matthew's story is wearing hats, at least not that we know of. But it's still just as easy to tell who the bad guys are. They're the ones who wear the titles Pharisee and Sadducee. It's kind of ironic, actually, because the Pharisees and the Sadducees really didn't much care for one another. The Sadducees represented the powerful elites, the religious establishment centered in Jerusalem. Many priests were Sadducees. Pharisees, on the other hand, were mostly everyday folks, working class people. They represented kind of a revivalist or a pietist movement in Judaism dedicated to applying the law to their whole lives taking religion from just at the temple to every day. Pharisees and Sadducees were on opposite ends of the political and theological and socioeconomic spectra. So how odd them, then, for them all to find themselves wearing the same color hat? And that's exactly what Matthew is doing here. Right at the beginning of the story, when members of these two parties show up among the crowds to be baptized by John, Matthew puts them in black hats for us, calling them a brood of vipers. Now, that's an epithet that even we modern readers can understand, even if the cultural weight is somewhat lost. Vipers are dangerous, stealthy, predatory. With very little rhetorical effort, Matthew quickly makes us grin at the thought of these Pharisees and Sadducees getting the business end of that axe he's talking about. Matthew doesn't have to work hard at this because we are always on the lookout for who's wearing the black hat. Every story needs a villain, some person or force that opposes the protagonist at every turn. Something over, or someone over which the hero triumphs at the end. Here, Matthew simply tells us who to put under our black hat. But there's a question to ponder. Why do we need anyone to wear them? Is it because that life teaches us that there's always a villain, always someone out there who is a threat to us and our way of life? Or is it the other way around? Is our life experience colored by our expectation, our need for someone to wear a black hat? Let me explain that a little bit. The human brain is very good at categorization. It's an evolutionary advantage to us to be very quickly able to sort things into types, like which kinds of berries are safe to eat and which are poisonous, or what behaviors in others are friendly and which are threatening. That way, when we encounter something new, our brains can quickly sort these new things as either safe or threatening based on past experience and help us respond accordingly. That category of enemy or villain, then, that black hat that we carry around, may be a survival mechanism hardwired into our brains by evolution to keep ourselves and our communities safe. But still, I wonder. Is there always a villain? Or are our brains just wired in such a way that we always have to identify a villain, whether or not there is one? I wonder if we need someone to wear a black hat in order for us to feel safe. That might seem counterintuitive at first, but think about it. As long as we know who's wearing the black hat, we know where the danger is, right? Otherwise, we're always wondering if there's some unknown threat sneaking up on us like a snake in the grass. The black hat gives us an issue or an idea or a person on which we can focus our attention. Having a common enemy can even bring us together, like it did the Pharisees and the Sadducees. If we can just get rid of that black hat, our problem will be solved. Good triumphs over evil. The hero saves the day. Everyone lives happily ever after. But what if it's not that simple? While John is warning this brood of vipers who are in danger of being cut off, Paul describes how God in Christ is grafting on. 
In chapter 11, a little bit before our reading today, he describes the church like an olive tree. He says that God has grafted in these Gentile wild branches into the cultivated Jewish tree in the orchard. And so he urges both Jews and Gentiles in today's reading to welcome one another as Christ has welcomed each of them. Such a welcome, he says, is both a symptom of what God is already doing as well as a sign of this thing that is still to come, this peaceable kingdom imagined by Isaiah. Jews and Gentiles being brought together into one community is a foreshadowing is foreshadowing a reality in which even leopards lie down with goats and wolves and sheep bed together. And so I begin to wonder, what if this call to repent is an invitation for us to bring together rather than to cut apart? What if it's an invitation for us to lay down our axes and pick up our grafting knives? What if preparing the way of the Lord is better accomplished by welcoming these people wearing black hats than by trying to defeat them? We certainly hear that from Matthew's Gospel. Jesus would have us pray for our enemies, turn the other cheek, forgive 70 times 7. If we look forward to a future where the calf and the lion cub and the fatling all romp together, then maybe now is the time to start arranging some playdates. But what happens when we can't do that? What about all those situations in which the danger is real? Because we still live in a world where lions do not eat straw, right? We live in a world where folks still shoot up LGBT nightclubs and burn mosques. The reality is that any kid who attempts to snuggle with a leopard is going to be eaten. Some things are simply beyond our ability to heal, despite our best efforts, so far. I notice that the slur John uses for the enemies in this story is brood of vipers. And that directs my attention to another line in Isaiah's poem. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put its hand in the adder's den. As he imagines this peaceful reign of God, Isaiah, maybe you noticed this, is imagining the reversal of an old curse. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. Sound familiar? That was the curse in Genesis after the eating of the fruit and the casting out of the garden. What's particularly striking to me is that this curse is not pronounced upon the humans who sinned, but upon the serpent, the enemy. In other words, Isaiah's vision includes healing and welcome for the enemy, the one wearing the black hat, as a part of God's promise. The original curse was brought about by something the serpent did, but the reversal of that curse will be accomplished by God. We may not yet be in a position to be able to forgive all hurts or reconcile all relationships. But what I hear today is that what we cannot put together, God can and God will. Those things that we are not capable of fixing, God will fix. That's the promise I hear in these stories, acts notwithstanding. In fact, I wonder if, in spite of John's protestations, this brood of vipers coming down to the Jordan to be baptized may not itself be a sign of hope, that maybe this promise is not so far-fetched after all. Even if the Pharisees and the Sadducees are coming for the wrong reasons, they're still coming. If Pharisees and Sadducees can come together, even if it is out of a desire, mutual desire for power, then why not wolves and lambs? 
that there is hope in this story even for serpents makes me believe that there is hope for all of us. I wonder how many of us in reading this story are eyeing that axe lying at the root of the tree with a sense of fear or worry. Being able to point to the cowboys and the black hats helps convince us that there are other trees that would be chopped down before us. But here the message is that even the remaining stumps are capable of sending up new shoots. Isaiah is waiting for the coming of a righteous king. We wait for someone or something better than a king. We wait for the coming of God who is able to bring life from death and healing from harm. I think the grand question of Advent is this. Knowing what lies ahead, what is our place in the world as we wait? We can continue to follow our biological imperative, sorting the world and the people in it into black hats and white hats, into things that are evil and things that are good, but is that really what will serve us best? What happens to us if we begin to imagine a world without hats, so to speak? A world in which the enmity between the serpent and the nursing child is erased, and the offspring of Eve plays over the adder's den. We may not live in that world yet, but it is coming. So how are we preparing for that? We know the fruit that brought about the curse in Eden. But the question today, what are the fruits of repentance?